Father, I thank you so much for everyone that you've brought here this evening. Lord, we're not here by chance. Lord, we're here by your divine appointment tonight. Lord, I thank you that as we share about the wonder and the awe of your creation, Lord, that you're going to speak a living word to someone's heart tonight. Lord, someone is tired this evening. You're coming with refreshing. Someone is worried this evening. Lord, you're coming with peace. Someone is burdened, and Lord, you're coming with relief tonight. Father, I thank you that this is going to be a wonderful time in your presence while we look into the truth of your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen. The Bible opens with the most profound words that have ever been uttered. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know of all the truths in the Bible, this very first truth is the one that is under the fiercest attack today. Because everything else that the Bible says hinges on those first 10 words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those words define God for us. And they also define our lives in relationship to him. If God really did create us, then he has the right of ownership over us. We're not free to live as we please, but we're made to please him. You know, for that reason, creation is a truth that men have tried to escape for centuries. Maybe you were taught along the way that Genesis 1 verse 1 is just a fairy tale. Maybe that you were taught that the story of creation in the Bible is incompatible with the discoveries of modern science. Maybe you were taught that billions and billions of years ago, an electrical charge randomly fired in a primordial soup of hydrogen and protein, and a living cell was born. And from that one living cell, everything else just randomly came to be. Maybe you were taught that as a scientific fact. But tonight, I want to invite you to join us in taking a fresh look at creation. I want to invite our friend Brian Robbins uh, to come this evening. Brian's going to get us going and get us out of the gate. Uh, Brian did a wonderful job sharing about the Bible last week. Would you welcome Brian while he comes this evening? Thank you, Pastor Glenn. Hi again. How great is our God. I love that song. It was a perfect song for tonight because when you marvel at creation, you can only say how great is our God. Uh, I'm really going to work hard tonight um, to do this in the 20 minutes allotted to me because creation is a huge topic, but it's also exciting and hopefully I'll have some fun. Um, what I'm going to try to cover tonight are four principal themes in 20 minutes or less. One is, how does creation point us to God? We're going to talk quite a bit about that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about creation and God in Scripture. Because um, we learn an awful lot about God in Scripture. And then I'm going to try and talk a little bit about the six days of creation and the seventh, days of, seventh day of rest. And what that might be pointing to. And then we'll lead into a little discussion about creation and obedience that leads into Pastor Glenn's talk on the fall. So if it's okay, I always like to start with Scripture. So I'd like to just read two verses from Scripture, which I think perfectly frame how does creation point us to God. The first is Romans 1.20. I'm reading from the NIV, but there are other translations, but the, the verse is just so beautiful, so if you'll indulge me. For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature had been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So God is evident through his creation. And Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. If you just look around at everything we see, the complexity of the universe, the beauty of a flower, the magical way that a bird flies across the ocean, 
uh, above an ocean and, and with the moon behind it and its beauty. It speaks, it screams of God. So let's talk a little bit about some of the empirical evidence that God exists from creation and trying to keep it really simple because this is the way I think about it. When you see a beautiful painting, you look across the room, you see a beautiful oil painting, it's a picture of a landscape and there's trees and there's a person and it's glorious and it's textured. How do you know that there was a painter? Because it's there. When you see a building, you walk into New York City, you see a skyscraper, you open up the door, you turn on the lights, the lights go on, you go into an elevator, you push the button, you go up to the 60th floor, it goes to the 60th floor. How do you know that there was an architect who built that building and all those systems worked? Well, because it worked. When you see an airplane at an airport, it's Boeing 747, and you go in and you, you go in and look in the cockpit and all the controls, and lo and behold, you push the button and the engine comes on and the plane goes down the runway and it takes off and it flies. How do you know that there was an engineer who designed that? Because it's there. These seem like so such easy questions. These are layups, right? Okay. So why is it when we look at the human being and we marvel at the complexity of the human being, it puts to shame, infinitesimally to shame, how complicated an airplane is, the cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, our cells, our blood, our brain that no even scientist can understand. We look at a human person and we know there is a creator. Amen. Amen. I'll say further, if you took hundreds of the most brilliant scientists who have ever lived, Albert Einstein times 100, and put them in a room together for their entire lifetime and gave them all the materials they asked for, the benefit of all the science, and they had the purpose and intention to design a human being, they couldn't do it, they couldn't design a single cell and bring life to a single cell. And we're supposed to look at the universe in all its complexity and think it just happened by chance? It's humbling to think about the complexity of the universe. Let's look at mankind, look at man's conscience. It's very interesting to me that across cultures, across religions, across the world, mankind seems to share a consistent conscience, which, by the way, is remarkably similar to the Ten Commandments. Why is that? If we're a product of natural selection, and I'm going to talk about evolution in a moment, why are people motivated to engage in acts of philanthropy? Why do people sacrifice their lives sometimes for strangers? That seems to go against the doctrine of natural selection. Let's talk about first cause. There's a fundamental idea in physics that for something to have motion, something had to start it. If I had a ball and I saw a ball rolling, it, maybe it was a hand that pushed the ball. Or maybe it was the wind that pushed the ball. Maybe it was gravity that caused the ball to fall. It was something. If the universe is expanding, and we all here read about it on, in the newspapers and books, see on TV, that scientists are looking at telescopes and they can tell us that the universe is expanding. So it's moving. So what made it move? There had to be something, and scientists call this the Big Bang. Okay, I got that. If there was a Big Bang, something must have caused the Big Bang. And for the Big Bang to have resulted in the expansion of matter, something had to create matter out of nothing. That's God. Amen. Here's a simple thought. Again, I like to keep it simple. That's the way I think. A chicken comes from an egg. Yes? An egg comes from a chicken. Think about it. Chicken comes from an egg, okay. Egg comes from a chicken. Where does it start? I believe in the, I, I believe in the Big Bang. I'm going to be honest with you, I do. God spoke and bang. <laughs> Amen. Let, yeah, that deserves an applause. Let's talk about evolution because we all learn it in school. Um, the theory of evolution started with Charles Darwin. He wrote a book called The Origin of the Species. Um, it's a pretty good book. I've read it. And that theory, as subsequently modified by subsequent people after Darwin, basically says that all life evolved from a common organism. 
and that uh, we ended up all these different animals, including ultimately mankind, because of evolution, evolution through random mutations assisted by natural selection. Interestingly, however, the same science that is telling us this tells us empirically that mutation in almost all observed instances always leads to degradation. There's, there's no concept of mutation that ever leads to enhancement, but this is the theory. I'll also point out that no th experiment ever, 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 ever conducted in any forum at any university by anybody has ever demonstrated at all the efficacy or believability of evolution. Fruit flies, by the way, are still fruit flies. There are ten thousands or hundreds of thousands of fruit flies and you know, a scientist has not found a way to turn a fruit fly into anything other than a fruit fly. By the way, how about those sharks? You know, we read about sharks on the Discovery Channel, that sharks have been around for millions and millions and millions of years. Why is it still a shark? If we're supposed to have evolved over the same period of time to all these other species, why is the shark still swimming around? If you put a monkey in a room in front of a typewriter and gave it eternity to randomly type on the typewriter, do you really believe that the monkey would end up typing Shakespeare's Hamlet perfectly with every comma and every period in just the right place? Really? And yet, we're supposed to believe that through random mutation, albeit assisted by natural selection, that we are here. And don't forget, as beautiful a creation as mankind is, and we are unique, that's the tip of the iceberg. This is here, the universe, the stars. Let's talk about the doctrine, it's a big word, but it's a simple concept, irreducible complexity. And what scientists tell us about that is, in criticizing Darwin's theory of this idea of random mutation, mutation followed by natural selection, they look at an organ like the eye, and all this means is the eye is really complicated. God knows what he's doing. No one knows how to build an eye, even today. But it's so complicated that if you change even a little piece of the operational activity of the eye, it doesn't work at all. So this idea that we'd have random mutation to make things better, that doesn't work. You mutate, you can't see. It, so many simultaneous mutations would have to happen to enhance an eye to make it work. It would all have to happen at the same time. It just doesn't hold water. There is something called microevolution that I do believe in. In other words, I do believe that over time, you, tr traits within a species can evolve, but there's no instance of a species ever migrating to another species. And scripture tells us, of course, that God created all animals according to their kinds. Hey, what about all those transitional fossils? If you believe evolution, and Darwin's own book said he expected this to be found, you would expect to find millions of examples of transitional species. I mean, if an alligator turned into a fish, or a fish turned into an alligator, where's all the intermediate species? If a monkey turned into a man, where are the, not one example of what turns out to be a pig bone, where are the millions of transitional fossils? They're not there. And Darwin himself said that if they didn't find these fossils, there was something wrong with his theory. So if the church of today, barring last week's sermon, the younger generation were asking Darwin what he thought about this, they'd say, what up? And by the way, and then we're going to move off evolution in a moment, there's something called the Cambrian Explosion. I'm not making this stuff up. Archaeologists tell us, scientists tell us, that about 540 million years ago, something really interesting happened. Before this, quote, Cambrian period, there were relatively few fossils of different types of life forms. And all of a sudden, boom! There are myriads and myriads of different types of species, not evolved all at once, in a re certainly on an, on an evolutionary scale in terms of time, all in the relatively same period of time. Animals, invertebrates, fish, all happening at the same time, sounding, by the way, remarkably like the story in the book of Genesis. Scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews, verse 11, 3, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Amen. What does Scripture tell us about God and creation? Well, the synopsis or the summary, I would say, is that the natural word is sustained by God and speaks of God. So let's look at some verses together. God created. In the beginning, as Pastor Glenn said, 
God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, John 1, 1 to 3, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So God created and God sustains us. God upholds the natural order, Hebrews 1.3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He sustains us. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of, of the majesty in heaven. In Psalm 135, in the Psalms where he gets tremendous inspiration, talking about God upholding the natural order, the Lord does whatever he pleases in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and in all their depths. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with rain and brings out the winds from its storehouses. He sustains humanity, Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his his offspring. Without God, church, we are nothing. God created us for his great glory. Again, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and from whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom all things we live. God has given humanity responsibility to preserve creation when he said that in Genesis how God blessed us and asked us to multiply and to rule over the fish in the seas, but we have an obligation to sustain and respect God's creation. It's here for our use, but we have an obligation to preserve it. And creation itself speaks of God's nature and his character. Again, in, jo in Job, the oldest book in Scripture, arguably, 12, 7 to 10. But ask the animals, and they will teach you. The animals get it. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. It's only man today who says God has nothing to do with it. We want to banish God from our schoolhouses and say that we were created through random mutation assisted by natural selection. Scripture tells us that mankind is a unique creation of God. In Psalm 8, 1 to 9, God tells us, Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. This is my favorite verse in Scripture, I think. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place... What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and all the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in the heaven and the earth. So what does Genesis tell us about creation? So we've got empirical proof that God created and that creation points to God. Scripture tells us, as you know, in, in the book of Genesis, that God created in six days and rested on the seventh. Hey, are those 24-hour days or long periods of time? There's a reasonable interpretation either way. I think they're six days, but I'm not fighting with a Christian who believes it was a long period of time. But God created in six days, however you want to define the days, and he rested on the seventh day. Does that mean that God literally created man out of the dust of the earth? I actually believe that God can do that. My God can do it, and I believe it. Do I need to fight with a Christian who believes that God, through intelligent design, chose to direct some process which led to the creation of a real man, Adam is the first man? Maybe. Maybe. It's not worth fighting about. But my God can do this. I, I believe that God created the world in six days. And I believe that he created man out of the dust of the earth and to dust we will return. 
Six days God used to create, but interestingly, on the seventh day, it says that God rested. And what do we read happens in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden? I believe that the seventh day was intended to be a perpetual rest. And when Adam and Eve were walking in the garden in the fellowship with God, that was our rest. That was our shalom. That was our peace. Or as Pastor Nick said a couple weeks ago, our shalom, shalom. Ultimate peace, ultimate rest. In fact, in Judaism, the Talmud teaches, that's the the Talmudic teachings, the teachings of the great Jewish rabbis, that the Sabbath that happens every seventh day is a glimpse of what it will be like in the world to come. I think they had that right. I believe that God intended us to have perfect rest in his fellowship and that when we came to faith in Yeshua Jesus, we entered that rest. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, God tells us in Hebrews 4, 9 to 11, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example or disobedience. So God creates in six days this wonderful universe for us, this world for us, and invited us to enter into his rest. Pastor Glenn's going to talk in a moment about what we did about that. But the beautiful thing is, God gave us the hope to enter into his rest one more time that's made available to us through our faith in Jesus. Lastly, setting, leading right into Pastor Glenn, because I'll link at the time here, and due attribution to Pastor Paul Washer, whom I borrowed this from in part. He, he, he said something like this in a different context, but I love it. Here stands God on the day of creation. God looks at the stars and he says, stay there and move in this pattern at my command. And they obey. God commands the planets. He says, pick yourselves up and place yourself here and there and there until I give you another word. And the planets obey. God looks at the mountains and he says, be lifted up. And he looks at the hills and the valleys and he says, be cast down. And they obey. God looks at the sea and he says, come this far and come no further. And the sea obeys. God looks at mankind and he says, you my greatest treasure may eat of any tree in the Garden of Eden. But do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And man says, no. And disobeys. With that, the fall of Pastor Glenn. We're gonna we're gonna make a Pentecostal out of you yet, Brian. And you you left your Rolex. Is this a gift or? <laughs> Bless you, friend. <laughs> Picking up on this story right there, I want to make three quick observations about the creation this evening. The first observation that I want to make this evening is that the earth is not as good as it used to be. Genesis chapters 1 through 2 tell the story of God's creation. And then Genesis chapter 3 tells the story of Satan's deception of Adam and Eve, their disobedience to God, and the aftermath. By the way, I want to say to you, if you don't have a Bible of your own, we'd love to give you a copy of the Bible. And we have very nice copies on the back table. And uh, if you're here this evening, you don't have a, a copy of the Bible, especially one that is in uh, readable a good readable uh, English translation. We'd love to give you one tonight. But the story is in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. And we're very much acquainted with the consequences of sin on humanity. We call it the fall of man. And the first and the most disastrous consequence was death. Paul said in Romans 5, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all men because all have sinned. When Adam died, when Adam sinned, he died spiritually. His vital connection to God was severed. His constant, intimate relationship with God was broken. 
His communication with God was curtailed. His ability to access the spirit realm was denied. And so as a result of that, we are all born spiritually dead. Adam also began a slow death in his soul. Guilt and shame and insecurity entered his psyche. Dysfunction entered the first family. Blame and resentment and deceit and manipulation and emotional isolation. And Adam also began a slow death in his body. God created our bodies to live forever. But the process of aging began. Sickness and disease, corruption of our DNA, vulnerability to demonic attacks on our health, and eventually physical death became a reality for mankind as well. We're pretty familiar with that, but sometimes we forget that Adam's disobedience also had disastrous consequences on the entire creation. Someone put it this way, the fall of man was a cosmic catastrophe. Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 8. He said the creation waits with eager expectation for the sons of God, that's us, to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in pain. And not only so, but we ourselves also groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption as sons. That is the redemption of our bodies. I have a house full of bug-hating ladies. My wife and my girls hate spiders. They hate stink bugs. I don't know, y'all have stink bugs. Where are they coming from? Silverfish. And my daughter, Lauren, learned that all of these bugs are a result of the entrance of sin into the world. And so she'll ask me all the time while we're riding along in the car, Daddy, are bees a part of sin? <laughs> are mosquitoes a part of sin? We had a mountain lion roaming around the neighborhood a year ago, and so Lolly asked me, Daddy, are mountain lions a part of sin? We had a bear the year before that in our church dumpster. She said, are bears a part of sin? And it's true. The earth is not as good as it used to be. A few consequences of the fall of man on the creation. One thing I find is that our essential relationship to the creation has been altered. Not only was our relationship with the creator altered, but our relationship with his creation was altered. Originally, God created us to have dominion over all the earth. Mankind and nature were in perfect harmony with one another. The elements of nature were perfectly favorable in every way for indefinite human existence. People and animals existed together in peaceful harmony. After Adam's fall, God pronounced five curses. And one of them was that our relationship with creation is now adversarial in its tenor. The world is not the hospitable environment that it once was. Survival is more of a struggle for us now. That's why we talk sometimes about battling the elements or protecting ourselves from the elements. I had a roommate in Bible college. He pastors a great church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I saw yesterday on Facebook they had two feet of snow there. I think if it snowed two feet on April 23rd, I would cry. <laughs> In fact, creation has come under the illegitimate control of Satan and his demons. Satan has power, influence. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He has power to influence the weather, the earth's climate, animals, just as he influences people and groups and whole nations. Our relationship to the creation has been altered. Not only that, but as a result of the fall, animal life has been altered. In Genesis 1, verses 29 to 30, and again in Genesis 9, 3, it tells us that the original diet for mankind and for all animal life was plants. Before the fall, there was no death on earth at all. 
animals were not predatory. They didn't eat each other. All animal life was under the dominion of mankind, and they neither feared men nor attacked them. We didn't have to worry back then about the Greenwich mountain lion or about the black bear in our dumpster. We didn't have to worry about claws and teeth and parasites and blood-sucking insects. In fact, it's highly probable that animals and people communicated with one another. Eve was not surprised when the serpent spoke to her. God untied the mouth of Balaam's donkey so that he could communicate with Balaam. Perhaps that's indicative of the way that it once was. I would say to you that it is not that way any longer. So if you do find animals talking back to you, come see us, all right? We'll, we'll help you. Also, as a result of the fall, plant life has been altered. After the fall, thorns and thistles appeared for the first time. Plants develop, develop defense mechanisms from humans and animals that they didn't have before. They never needed them because the relationship then was harmonious and now it's adversarial. As a result of the fall, inanimate objects in creation have been altered. The ground is not the same as it once was. It does not easily produce for our consumption the way it first did. The atmosphere is not the same as it was. The subterranean composition of the earth is not the same as it was. The effects of, the, of sin on the creation culminated in Noah's day in the devastation of a worldwide flood. And by the way, uh, archaeological evidence is compelling uh, across the entire spectrum for a worldwide flood. The canopy that was above the earth collapsed. It had created a greenhouse that kept the Earth's atmosphere constant and the climate stable. Water was released from beneath the Earth. It cooled the heat that emanated from inside the Earth, and it kept that landmass stable. It's highly possible that the flood altered both the shape and the axis of the Earth. We know that the landmass was definitely altered. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25 talks about the division of the continents after the flood during the days of a man named Peleg, whose name means divided by water. That's why the east coast of South America and the west coast of Africa fit perfectly into one another, and recent scientific research has shown that they were connected a lot more recently than scientists first thought. The consequence is that Earth's climate is not as good for us as it once was. It's not as friendly to human existence and longevity as it was. That's why people lived for hundreds and hundreds of years before the flood and then for shorter and shorter spans after the flood. If you live in the north, you have to keep moving all the time to stay alive. In the summer, you've got to take advantage of the window of opportunity to plow and to plant and to harvest before the winter sets in and you'll freeze and starve to death. If you live in the south, you can't move too fast or you'll die from the heat. Prior to the fall and to the flood, the Earth's climate was comfortable and constant. There were no extremes anywhere. Listen to this. Prior to the fall and to the flood, there were no natural catastrophes. No volcanoes, no earthquakes, no tsunamis, no hurricanes, no monsoons, no blizzards, no floods, no landslides, no sinkholes, no gale force winds, no tornadoes, no thunder and lightning. Can you imagine? We wouldn't have to spend $150,000 to put a generator on the building for the next time Sandy comes to visit. You know what the ironic thing about that is, is that we refer to these things now as acts of God. And God's up in heaven saying, hey, don't pin it on me. I made everything perfect. You messed it up. So the next time there's a story on the news about a natural disaster, we pray for people in the Midwest who are experiencing terrible, terrible flooding right now. And by the way, all of those things now are necessary for the regulation of our climate. Before they weren't, now they are. But the next time you hear about people being affected by one of these natural catastrophes, just remember my little lolly, it's a part of sin. As a result of the fall, God limited his sustaining power in creation. 
God is still the one, as Brian shared with us, that sustains the life of every person. And he sustains the life of every living thing. But God has loosened his grip to allow for decay and eventually for death to occur. Psalm 90 verse 10 says that God has assigned an average lifespan of approximately 70 to 80 years to mankind. Personally, I believe that it can be as much as 120 for people who are followers of Jesus. I'm not sure I really want to live that long. I can't wait to go see him. But either way, God now allows decay in our human bodies and in all of creation. Finally, as a result of the fall, people have lost sight of the purpose for which they were created. Paul said that in the fall, God has subjected creation to frustration, a sense of discontentment in life, a sense of lostness or aimlessness, a sense of aloneness or insignificance. Because we refused God's leadership, because we refused to be thankful, God gave us over to spiritual ignorance and a life devoid of ultimate purpose. What is so sad about that is that although we are not the physical center of the universe, we are at the very center of its purpose. When you go out and you see the beautiful starry sky at night and you can look beyond the atmosphere of this earth into the heavens, just allow yourself to be awed for one moment by the truth that God created all all of that, all of that out there, the entire expanse just to sustain life right here on earth. And he created life right here on earth to commune with him forever. In the fall, man lost sight of that, but Jesus died on the cross to restore that sense of divine purpose to every one of us who believe on him and receive him. Three observations about the creation. The earth is not as good as it used to be, but I have good news tonight. The second observation is that the earth will get better than it is today. Paul tells us that the redemption purchased by Jesus isn't just the redemption of people, it's the redemption of the entire creation. At the end of this age, the earth will go through cataclysmic upheavals. There will be horrific human wars there will be dreadful demonic manifestations and there will be unprecedented natural disasters. Jesus will rapture his church. Believers in Jesus who have died and those who are presently alive will be instantly transformed and caught up into heaven. Revelation chapter 20 calls this the first resurrection. Then Jesus will physically return to the earth with all of his saints. Satan and his demons will be bound, and King Jesus will reign from the city of Jerusalem for a period of 1,000 years. During that time, the earth will revert back to its original state of beauty and harmony. Revelation chapters 20 and 21 talk about it. Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 65, the book of Daniel talks about this time on earth. All those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ will come with Christ to help administrate his kingdom on earth. We'll be given charge over various territories. I don't know about you, but I'm going to stake my claim now. The harmony between man and creation will be restored. Animal life will be restored to its original nature. Animals won't be predatory anymore. Plant life will be restored to its original nature. The climate of the earth will be restored to their original settings. Listen to Isaiah. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf will lie down with the lion. And a little child will lead them. Dominion. Bears will drink cow's milk and their young will be lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of a cobra, and a toddler will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There will still be a human population on the earth, 
after the great tribulation and they will live for hundreds of years again. They will thrive. The human population will explode with the vast majority of them choosing to follow Jesus. No one will disbelieve in Jesus, but there are yet some who will refuse his leadership over their lives. But can you imagine how wonderful the earth will be during the millennium? I drive my kids to school every morning. The back roads between here and the kids' school are absolutely beautiful pretty much in every season. But I remember one June morning about a year ago when the orange tiger lilies had just started blooming all along the roads as we were driving. And I thought to myself, what a beautiful place this world were, would be if it weren't for the presence of sin. And I was really thinking at the moment about the ugliness of what people do to each other. How awesome would it be if you could go anywhere and not have to worry about protecting yourself from anyone? But then I started thinking about the, all the consequences of sin in the world. And I started thinking about what the world will be like during the millennial reign. Think about how much more beautiful the world will be than it is even now. Think about how awesome it will be when you can hike anywhere, when you can swim anywhere, when you can explore anywhere, and you don't have to worry about protecting yourself from animals. You won't have to worry about protecting yourself from insects or reptiles or great whites. You won't have to worry about protecting yourself from poison ivy or poison oak or from thorns. Think about how awesome the world will be when you don't have to battle the elements when you don't have to worry about shelter, when you don't have to worry about working hard for food or buying oil for your furnace, when you don't have to worry about natural disasters, when you don't have to worry about wars. Think about how awesome the world will be when we don't have to grieve over tragedies like Sandy Hook anymore, and when we don't have to fight about gun laws. They'll be gone. If you're a believer in Jesus today, you're going to get to experience that. You're going to get to experience that in a glorified, resurrected body that will never get old, that will never get injured, that will never get sick, that will never die. I don't know about you, but when I was thinking about that this afternoon, that just makes me get excited. It sent chills up and down my spine to think of what is waiting for us. We get to experience at the end what it was like in the very beginning. Three observations about creation. I'm going to go fast with this last one, and it's time for our groups. Listen, the earth is not as good as it used to be, and it will get a little worse. But then the earth will be better than it is today when Jesus is king. And one final observation. One day, the earth will be replaced. At the end of the millennium, Satan will be released for a short time. Once more, he will gather together all the people on the earth who refuse Jesus' leadership. He'll lead them in a march against Jerusalem, but fire from God will destroy them. Then the second resurrection will occur, where the unbelieving dead of all time are raised again to stand before the great white throne of judgment. Beloved, look at me. There is a resurrection coming. A resurrection coming of all the dead, both the righteous and the wicked. The righteous will go off to their inheritance in God's eternal kingdom, and the wicked will go off into eternal punishment. Then a new heaven, the current heaven and earth will be destroyed. Paul wrote, By Jesus all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, whether visible or invisible, all things were created by him and for him. Listen, he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. There are two mysteries that science and medicine cannot unravel. One is what actually makes the human heart beat. And the other is what holds atoms together. Around the human heart is a bundle of nerves. It's called the bundle of hiss. Our friend Dr. Rana ta taught me, he, he's a cardiologist, he calls it his bundle. 
for all the doctors know about the human heart, for all that they can do, they can take a heart out of one man and they can put it in the chest of another man, but for all of that, they still don't know what makes the heart beat. They don't know what makes that little bundle of nerves begin to fire. They don't know what makes them continue firing, and they don't know why they stop firing when they do. But we do. David wrote, My heart and my flesh might fail, but God, you are the source of my life. The atom is the most basic building block of all matter, and it's a scientific impossibility. Atoms shouldn't stay together, but they are held together by an invisible force that science has named, but they cannot identify. The Bible tells us what it is. It's Jesus Christ who holds everything together. And one day, he is going to let go. Peter wrote, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The heavens will be destroyed and the elements will melt in the heat. The Greek word for elements in 2 Peter 3 is the word stoichen. And it means the basic building blocks of matter or atoms as we call them today. The word for destroy is the word to loose, to let go. So what Peter is telling us is that literally one day, Jesus, who is currently holding all things together, will let go, and the entire universe is going to be destroyed. And then God will create a new universe, a new heaven and a new earth. The little that we know is that it will be radically different from our earth. There will be no sun, there will be no moon, there will be no sea. That means there will also be no oxygen, and our resurrected bodies won't need it. We don't know what it will look like, but we know that it will be a place of beauty that can't be compared to anything on earth. And it will be permeated by the light of God's presence. We'll have knowledge of all things. And the effects of sin will never, ever be felt again. John said, I heard a loud voice saying, now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. As we turn to our groups now, let me end you with a question of St. Peter's from 2 Peter chapter 3. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. Peter writes this in 2 Peter 3, 11, Since the world will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? God bless you, everyone. And I'm going to turn it over to our group leaders now and uh, have a great time discussing.